right, Miss Nero, you have to lie down. Lie down, sweetheart. Good girl, all the way. Good girl. Good girl. Nira is a new guide dog. She comes from Guiding Eyes for the Blind. It's one of the nation's premier guide dog schools located just outside of New York City. I've had her three months. She was well trained when she went out the door, and my job is to keep the training going. And uh, that means, you know, don't chase rabbits and don't get up in the middle of a talk and wander the room looking for gum or breadcrumbs. So um, I've got her leash draped over my wrist. Should she get up and try to wander, it will be my job to remind her. Thank you for having me here this evening. I'm delighted to be in Des Moines and to have a chance to read some poetry and nonfiction here at the public library. Public libraries are a very important component of our nation's cultural and political life. I have uh, the good fortune to have grown up in a family with a dad who was a college president and who helped to build two libraries during his lifetime. So we spent a lot of time in my family talking about how important the public library is to civics and to, as I say, the, uh, the cultural and, and artistic life of our nation. A free nation depends on great libraries, so it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I am going to read using this device that you may be able to see. This is called a PacMate. It's a pocket PC for blind people. There are several brands. This one is made by Freedom Scientific Corporation. It runs pocket PC, which means Windows, Outlook, Word, Excel, Internet Explorer, and all of those types of programs. And it can connect up to my desktop PC and help me keep an organized calendar and keep track of my contacts and notes. It's a great machine. Um, I'm using it as a kind of audio teleprompter with an earbud in my left ear um, so that I can read my text to you in Microsoft Word, read to me in the voice of Stephen Hawking, <laughs> which I will then translate through my own vocal cords through the miracle of operatic breathing and turn into my own voice. Here's a little section from Eavesdropping, the new book of nonfiction, which came out uh, a year ago in the autumn from W.W. Norton. That book was suggested to me by an innocent question asked of me by a woman at a talk I was giving in Boston. I was speaking at uh, the Carroll Center for the Blind, a noted rehab agency for helping blind people get back on their feet, learn how to orient and navigate, and learn about technology and ways to work and have a good life. And, and I was there talking about the joys of traveling, particularly in the company of a guide dog, though I am no exceptionalist. I also travel places with my white cane, and uh, cane and canine are both important to me when I travel. Nonetheless, I had been talking about the, the pleasures of guide dog experience. And when the Q&A time came around, this woman said, well, why go anywhere if you can't see? And she was herself newly blind probably only 60, young, comparatively so, and yet for her, the doors, the horizons really of, of opportunity and really aesthetic pleasure, curiosity, all of those things seemed shut to her. So I got to thinking after the fact, what would it be like to write a book that celebrated just simply going places by yourself when you can't see? Could you write a book about sightseeing by ear? What would that be like? What would be the difficulties in doing it? Why hasn't someone done it yet? Uh, quickly realized that that's a book without a plot. It's aleatoric, to use that fancy word for just making your way by accident and discovery. It, it differs from reading the Blue Book or The Lonely Planet and going to a city and seeing the sights. You have to go places and see what you can discover by listening for chant sounds and music. It's a John Cage experiment. It's a fun thing to do, it turns out. It's interesting. Sometimes it's beautiful, sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's sublime, sometimes it's ridiculous. This is a little section from Eavesdropping in which uh, over a two-day period, I travel to three different cities and run into lunatics <laughs> who talk to me. And uh, so I've been in O'Hare Airport where a lunatic subcontractor whose job it is to help people find their gates if they're disabled has attempted to skirt the security system of the airport by taking me through the steam tunnels under the airport 
in the hopes that he can get me past security just to see if he can do it. So he's got this wheelchair with my luggage in it, which, has a, which makes it sound like a broken bowling ball. And we're moving through a steam tunnel under the building, and he's uh, asking me if I've ever considered offering myself up to the miracle of Jesus. <laughs> and uh, it's different when you're in a steam tunnel under the airport. This chapter began where a woman walked up to me after I'd done a workshop on uh, public policy and disability. She, in turn, had said, why don't you come to my church? We've cured many people with disabilities. And then last but not least, I finally get away from the guy with the you know, steam tunnels in the airport and get on my plane. And then this is what happens. So this is from eavesdropping. When I finally got on my plane and settled Vidal, he's my former guide dog, under my feet, I wondered about the miles that humanity walks uphill in search of a cure. It's strange enough to be a symbol for other people's curative longings, but it's odder still to be the figure of spiritual transference, as though receiving Jesus, the disabled verify the faith of disheartened Christians. Just insert for the heck of it, I'm an Episcopalian. I can feel I can say these things, you know. My blindness represents a promise of rescue to others. I was mulling this over when I became aware that the man next to me was looking me over without saying hello. There was a vacant seat between us. He didn't think I knew he was examining me, but he was definitely looking my way. And Vidal, sensing this, put his head up on the empty seat. The dog's move would start the conversation. If you don't mind my asking, said the stranger, how did you go blind? I was born this way, I said, and tried to calculate how many times I've been asked this question. I thought of how it might work in reverse if I were to say, how did you become such a nondescript little nebbish in a cheap business suit? <laughs> but, of course, I said no such thing. It's easier to get out of the intrusive moment if you can remain monosyllabic. <laughs> oh, born that way, he said then, as if he was remarking about the ingredients in a French stew. Oh, ground goose livers in the cassoulet. How unexpected. Were your parents blind? No, I said, not at first, but now they are. Glaucoma, asked the stranger. No, death, I said. <laughs> My parents are dead, and, and as the ancient Greeks well knew, all dead people are blind. Oh, he said, you are a philosopher. I saw this wasn't going well. I'd violated my monosyllable rule with a joke about dead people. I wondered what other mistakes I could now make. I could, for instance, tell him I was a writer. That would be a monumental blunder. The poet W. H. Auden once remarked that the best way he knew to end airplane conversations was to tell people he was a medieval historian. <laughs> yes, I said. I am a philosopher. Really, he said, as if he had discovered Spanish sausage in the cassoulet. And what do you do? I figured I should push a pawn. By day, he said, pausing for effect. I work for the airline as a systems analyst. Then he paused again. He was going to talk about Richard Rorty and post-analytic philosophy. I could feel it coming. But in my own time, he said, pausing, in my own time, I am a fire walker. Ah, I said, I'll bet you can't do that in the airport. He leaned close to me then, his breath heavy with the scent of garlic. Have you ever read the books of Carlos Castaneda? I wanted to stand up, make my way into the aisle, and kick myself for having given this guy room to clatter around in. 
I was now about to enter the occult landscape of peyote and volcanoes. I remembered a college classmate, circa 1973, who once insisted that he could get through college by reading only the works of Carlos Castaneda and smoking hash. Carlos Castaneda, guru of the Grateful Dead, shamanic traveler who visited world after world beyond the scope of the human retina. God, I thought, how regrettable that I have made this airplane moment possible. <laughs> yes, I have read Carlos Castaneda, I said, though not since the Nixon administration. The stranger, who was now my stranger, looked at me fixedly, or so I presumed, since he wasn't moving, and I could smell his breath. What do you know about fear? He asked. I knew it didn't matter what I said. Firewalker had found his stride. Fear is all around us, he said. Fear is in the air. You have it in your bloodstream. I nodded. Fear is what causes illness. All the major studies agree that fear, which the medical community likes to call stress, is the cause of illness. Yes, I said. It occurred to me that I'd never heard of a single reputable study linking stress as the direct cause of disease, but this wasn't going to be a reality-based discussion. I can bring you to my ranch where together we conquer fear. Fear is all around you, he said again. You are afraid, and I can help you. I nodded. I've cured people with multiple sclerosis, he said. They put aside their fear and walk through fire. I've cured people of mental diseases like schizophrenia. We walk 12 feet over the live coals, and then fear is gone, and once fear is gone, we enter a new world without pain. I'm not in pain, I said then, and was pleased to notice how convincing my voice sounded. I'm not in pain, and my blindness isn't remotely connected with fear or abjection or petite mal or cosmic suffering. Oh, you can say that, but wait until you have walked through the flames, he said. I knew better than to continue. I wasn't going to argue about the true facts associated with walking over coals. I knew that once wood is sufficiently burned, it acts as an insulator, that people can walk quickly over hot charcoal without feeling a thing. I'd read this in a magazine called The Skeptical Inquirer, published by a group of scientists who travel the world debunking claims by occultists. I sank lower into my seat and said I had to sleep. You don't know what you're missing, said Firewalker. I was quiet, leaning on the pillow I'd tucked against the far bulkhead. When I got back home to Columbus, Ohio, my wife read aloud a short article from a suburban weekly newspaper. The woman from the Holiday Inn, who had offered to cure me as we stood beside the lobby's waterfall, had been named Catholic Woman of the Year. The newspaper suggested, without irony, that she had cured people of disabilities. My wife stopped reading and suggested, helpfully, that I forget about blindness and let this ministry cure the tendonitis in my right shoulder. <laughs> I thought of how three strangers had offered to cure me over the past 48 hours. And then I remembered these lines by the poet Marvin Bell. It's life that is hard, waking, sleeping, eating, loving, working, and dying are easy. I knew then that I needed to wear Marvin's poem on a shirt whenever I'm knocking around in the public dark. All right, uh, bear with me here a moment. 
I'm going to skip to a different file here. I'm hearing the voice of Stephen Hawking. It would be terrible if you wound up in a black hole. You would turn into spaghetti in eight dimensions. I'll read a little opening section from Eavesdropping. This is an early chapter. Uh, as a little boy living in New Hampshire, rural New England in the 1950s, blind with parents who were oddly lovely and strange, uh, I would just get up and wander off into the woods and get lost. And they didn't worry about me, really. Now, there are drawbacks to that. They also didn't encourage me to get a white cane or learn how to be blind, and I had to figure that out later in life. But uh, parents in denial is not an uncommon story for kids with disabilities. It's certainly a venerable subject when you get together with people at the National Federation of the Blind or the American Council of the Blind or at the guide dog schools. Many blind people will tell you these sorts of stories. This is about a day when I was a little boy and I wandered away from home, got lost, wound up in a barn alone with a horse. Maybe it was a Saturday. I remember that my parents were still sleeping. I had a plan and dressed quietly. When I was certain that no one was awake, I slipped from the house. I loved to walk in the woods and followed the beams of light and depths of shade that fell between trees. I remember that on this particular day, I got lost while chasing light and found myself standing in front of the university's horse barns. I knew that somewhere in the cool space before me, a horse was breathing. I stood in the door and listened to him. He sounded like water going down a drain. Then I took one step forward into a pyramid of fragrances. What a thing to be a young boy smelling leather and hay and turds. From his place in the dark, the horse gurgled like water in the back of a boat. Mice scurried like beaded curtains, disturbed by a hand. I stood in that magical nowhere and listened to a full range of barn sounds. I was a blind child approaching a horse. Behind me, a cat mewed. Who would guess that horses sometimes hold their breath? The horse was eyeing me from his corner. Then two cats were talking. Wind pushed forcefully at the high roof. Somewhere up high, a timber groaned. My horse was still holding his breath. When would he breathe again? Come on, boy, breathe for me. Where are you? I heard him rub his flank against a wall. Then I heard him breathe again with a great deflation. He sounded like a fat balloon venting in circles. And then I imitated him with my arm pressed to my mouth. I made great flatulent noises by pressing my lips to my forearm. How do you like that horse? He snorted. I noticed the ringing of silence. An insect traveled between our bursts of forced air. Sunlight warmed my face. I was standing in a wide sunbeam. I was in the luminous whereabouts of horse. I was a very small boy, and I had wandered about a mile from home. Although I could see colors and shapes in sunlight in the barn, I was completely blind. But I had made up my mind to touch a horse. Shh. Judging by his breathing, his slow release of air, that sound of a concertina, judging by this, I was nearly beside him. And so I reached out, and there was the great wet fruit of his nose, the velvet bone of his enormous face. And we stood there together for a little while, all alive and all alone. At night, when I couldn't sleep, I thought of this horse. I thought of his glory, his fat sound. I thought 
of how he pinched the air around him with his breathing. The house and the trees swayed in the night wind. The horse was dry wood talking. He was all nerves and nostrils. He tightened and then unwound like a clock. He groaned like those Finnish women who stood beside the ocean waving their sticks. Strophe and anti-strophe, step, rhythm, pulse beat. I'd crossed a threshold, hearing and walking the uncertain spaces that opened before me. Let me close with one more little section from, from eavesdropping. This is a, another moment of uh, street comedy, just, just listening to the chance things that happen. Uh, I'm riding a bus in Columbus, Ohio, on my way to the university from my home, and uh, the following events unfold just perfectly. And uh, sometimes, you know, you just get these gifts if you write nonfiction. So here it is. This is a windy morning in Columbus, Ohio. I'm so angry. The voice is a man's, middle-aged, gravel in his windpipe. I'm so angry. He sways in the aisle of the bus, hands free, heavy feet dancing. Since I'm blind and I can't see what he's PO'd about, I nod and put my arms instinctively around my dog. Before the angry man has a chance to say anything else, a woman sitting to my immediate left and who is holding a mildly fussy baby says, my boyfriend's in prison, but when he gets out tomorrow, we're getting married. I don't know who she is addressing, but the angry man knows. He sways on those enormous feet, and I know he's looking her up and down. Suddenly he says, I could cook you something. He says it as though these are his first words to a woman after a long sea voyage. There's something horrifically cheerful in his tone. You could come over to my house and I'd cook you something you've never had before. Have you ever had fried pancreas? I do a mean pancreas, the baby fusses. I think it has a pacifier. The woman, a girl really, she sounds like she's about 16, says, my boyfriend's getting out of jail tomorrow and we're getting married. That don't mean you couldn't come over to my house for some pancreas, says angry man. I'm thinking there's something boozy going on here, but I don't smell liquor. I gotta buy a wedding dress tonight, says the girl. An angry man says, well, if you change your mind, here's my address. He hands her a piece of paper. And then he's gone. He bolts off the bus at a stop called Park of Roses. And I picture him hunting for rose hips under a shaggy trellis, something sweet to add to his pancreas. Now the girl turns my way, shoulders the infant, and says, my fiance is getting out of prison tomorrow, and we're getting married. I'm thinking that anger and hunger are probably the same word. And then I realize I have to say something. So I say, can you imagine eating pancreas without mint jelly? I mean, he didn't mention the condiments. And lucky for me, we're at my bus stop, and I say goodbye, and the dog and I lumber for the door. Walking the sidewalks, I think hunger, anger, wedding dress, prison, fried pancreas, mint jelly, prison, hunger, anger, dress, pancreas. I'm moving south on High Street 
opposite the campus of The Ohio State University, the neighborhood is a warren of beer joints and tattoo parlors and burrito shops. I hear coins in a cup. A woman blocks my way. My dog is stopped. The dog can't see a means of getting around her. The coins rattle like BBs in a can. Can you help me out? She says, I haven't eaten in days, and I'm not from around here. Her voice is like darkened sand. Before I have a chance to say anything, a man's voice says, keep moving, lady. And I hear the squawk of a radio and guess that the voice is from a cop. And now wind blows as if from the opened bag of the wind god and leaves whirl about us in a macabre dance and newspapers sail along the sidewalk and behind these not so innocent sounds I hear the woman's voice persisting. I'm hungry and I'm from out of town. Again, the cop tells her to keep moving. She says, I'm from out of town as if he hadn't heard. A college kid rattles past on a skateboard. The woman and the cop and my dog and I are all in the white desert of rhetorical hunger in Columbus, Ohio, where dark humanoid figures in a frameless window. The cop thinks this woman is harassing a blind man. This is what I think he's thinking. He thinks, because I'm blind, that I wear boots full of water, thinks I have a wooden bucket of charity potatoes in my kitchen. His voice is more impatient than it should be. He's a man walking among boulders, a man who's put upon by hard forces, natural disasters. Come on, lady, he says with a loud and frayed insistence, get moving. I want to say that she's okay. She's okay. She's okay with me. I want to tell the cop that there's an elemental and fast-burning thread that runs through every human life, that the cop's life will be changing before he knows it, that nothing in our Western will can alter this, that what you do with every minute is a sickle path. I say that I have some money for this woman. I say that I've been hungry before. I say that asking strangers for money is what churches do. I talk fast and without a gulp of air, and I thrust a $10 bill into the woman's cup. And then I say to the cop that he needs to help me find the crosswalk. And the cop finds himself escorting me because he is facing a crowd of passers-by. And what else is he going to do, really? There are moments when hunger rips into the silence in our lives. I don't say this aloud, but I do say to the cop that hunger is some days the first word out on the street. I tell the cop that no one knows who is really hungry and who is merely saying it. I tell the cop that's why Jesus fed everybody. Thank you. I think I was able to uh, stop uh, in just the right amount of time, just before the uh, alarm goes off telling us that we all have to check out our books. Uh, but I wanted to leave a little time for you know, any questions that people might have and give folks an opportunity to, uh, to chat. I think literary events should always be about community. And uh, I've been to a lot of readings in my lifetime. And I prefer it when the writer stops and we have a chance to talk. And, get to know each other. So uh, the only thing I'll request is that you don't raise your hands, because <laughs> it never works. Just blurt. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at the university? 
Sure, the question was, can I tell folks a little bit about my work at the university? Um, I have a unique position. I teach in the graduate program in the writing of creative nonfiction. And I also have a quarter time appointment as the first ever blind poet named to a college of ophthalmology faculty. I'm here to tell you I am a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Iowa, and I really look good in my white coat. Uh, my job with the College of Medicine is to talk about disability, public policy, medical ethics, the new uh, interdisciplinary field of disability studies, and uh, you know, to help doctors when they're putting together programs that help to educate the next generation of young physicians and nurses and so forth, uh, to think more broadly and imaginatively about disability and public, public, uh, public policy. So it's very exciting. Uh, three quarters of my time I teach the creative writing that I love, and then I, uh, I get to go across the river to the west side of the campus where humanists ordinarily don't go. I drop breadcrumbs so I can find my way back. <laughs> And, uh, and I spend time uh, with a group of very dynamic, interesting, uh, and vital physicians and researchers. I'm having a great deal of fun. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an exciting, exciting thing. Where all have you traveled? Where all have I traveled? Uh, I've been to 48 of the contiguous US states. I have been to seven foreign countries. Uh, for eavesdropping, I went to some places on purpose just to see what would happen. For instance, I, one chapter I go to Iceland uh, in late winter <laughs> because I've heard that the Cuban jazz musicians known as the Buena Vista Social Club are performing in Reykjavik. And it strikes me that this is a good story <laughs> and that I ought to just insert myself into it and see what I can find out. And of course, one of the things I tell my literary students all the time is that this is, this is a known thing. If you enter the story and there is sufficient space for things to happen, um, you'll be surprised and so will your reader you know, by what develops. Um, we all know that technique from Tom Wolfe, but many other nonfiction writers have employed it successfully. So um, enter a story that you don't, you don't really know what's going to happen and write about it along the way. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. And, you know, eavesdropping starts out with early childhood reminiscences, like the horse section I read you, where I'm talking about what it was like to love listening as a, as a child. But then it branches into adult travel, where I, I go places just for the, the sheer heck of, of seeing what will happen. And then there are obviously instances where I just run into lunatics and, and other oddities that I put in as well. So. Oh, I thought Reykjavik was a very civilized place. Um, they have the most amazing hot springs. Uh, the whole city is a hot tub. And the Icelandic people are remarkably warm and friendly. And uh, they have a very high level of culture there. And I was, I was quite favorably impressed. Uh, it was not my first experience of Scandinavia. I spent much of my childhood in Helsinki. And I've gone back to Finland many times. Um, I have a Scandinavian heritage. My last name's Finnish, and you know, so to to see Iceland was a, a bit like Finland. Of course, uh, Finland without trees. You know, it's all black volcanic rock, and I think there's one tree. It's in a museum, and you know, you sort of expect to see Leonard Nimoy as Spock, you know, lumbering over the hills with his tricorder. You know. It's a, it's a little bit uh, interplanetary, but, um, or extraplanetary, but, but it's, it's still beautiful. Do you think the lunatics are more likely to talk to you than the other people? Um, do I think the lunatics are more likely to talk and to me? Do people talk to you because of that? Um, I think lunatics simply find the person who looks most available. And it could be that I walk around with a smile on my face. I'm a smiley sort of person. So I probably do look approachable. I'm not sure that it's about blindness. Um, could be. Um, it's entirely possible that they say, ah, oh, here's a guy who can't see me. I'll come up and be weird. But, but I, I think not. I, you know, I think it, I think it, there's just something, there's just something, you know, oddly about me that, that people say, ah, here's a good soul. I suspect this happens to Bill Clinton a lot. <laughs> you know, there's like weirdos walk up to him. 
Somebody poisoned my radishes. <laughs> yeah, it happened to me once too. <laughs> I feel your pain. How does teaching impact my writing? Um, I would say in several ways. One is that when I'm thinking about how to encourage students to do certain things better, like this semester, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a broken record. You know, I'm just saying to students over and over again, you need to learn to write scenes. Scenes. What's a scene? You know, it's amazing. Graduate students are all like, um, a scene. What is a scene? They can't remember a definition from you know, intro to literature, and you know, I say, well, look, a scene is a unit in a story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, wherein you see a person or more than one person, or sometimes a landscape, but you see that central figure behaving, acting, unfolding, right? And it's really important to do that. Don't write exposition. Don't write a lot of, you know, neo uh, Walter Cronkite-ish exposition that takes the place of scene. Scene is crucial to creative writing. And, you know, you, so you wind up saying that kind of thing. And, and in the process, of course, I challenge myself to write better scenes. Um, you know, not long ago, I was challenging students to go out and enter a story that, uh, that they couldn't have imagined themselves being part of. Go someplace you're completely unfamiliar with and talk to people for a day. See what happens, you know. Well, that's the same sort of thing I like to challenge myself to do. And then last but not least, you know, if you spend enough time editing other people's work, um, you do become, I think, a better editor of your own work, which was the original idea that Paul Engel had, the founder of the Writer's Workshop at the University of Iowa, the great Iowa poet back in the late 30s. He said, if writers sit around a table and talk to each other about editing, it will make them better and stronger writers and better teachers of writing if all these things intersect. So I, I think all those things are true. Can you talk a little bit about Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a number of things at once. Um, I'm working on a book of poems, which is almost done. Um, I also have a book of long uh, sort of narrative poems or prose poems, really, um, about traveling places and envisioning them in my head, sort of a companion experiment to eavesdropping. That book is called Mornings with Borges, based on uh, a conversation I once had with a man whose mother spent her mornings in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, walking with the poet uh, George Luis Borges. Borges. She would describe what she saw and then he would describe what he saw. And I thought, that's a great idea. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to describe Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, so I, I describe all these places in highly improbable, uh, surrealistic poems. And then uh, I'm also working on a book of nonfiction, uh, which is going to be about the art of conversation and will be published as part of a series of little books being put out by the AARP. And I'm also working on a novel about the great Italian tenor Enrico Caruso, um, which I'm having a lot of fun doing. It turns out Caruso was not only the greatest tenor of the 20th century, but it was a great mystery to him why he had this voice. So it's a, it's a sort of darkly comical novel about the mystery of being Caruso, you know, on being John Malkovich, you know, it's on... <laughs> On, on being Caruso and having this magnificent voice that you can't quite understand. It's kind of a sweet novel about a remarkable Italian peasant. Can you talk about um, some places you've gone visiting where it's such a Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that any place can be ugly or beautiful in the audible ranges, right? So we could find uh, beauty in Des Moines today and a week later in the same location find grinding industrial machinery. So we have to be fair to places. You can find urban reconstruction going on uh, in any variety of landscapes and the 
uh, omnipresence of loud, ugly machinery that distorts and damages our, our audible landscapes can happen anyplace. Um, nonetheless, I'd say that one of the uglier cities for listening, uh, oddly enough, is London, which has horrific bottleneck traffic and a lot of construction and uh, is not uh, a particularly inspiring city for listening. You have to seek out specialized places in London to hear glorious things, and you can, of course. You can go to Covent Garden and hear the Royal London Opera, or you can hear um, the Royal London Philharmonic Orchestra, or you can hear plain song or chant or you know, uh, wonderful medieval singing. You can find these things for sure. Uh, you can go to Liverpool and, and go to the Cavern Club and hear you know, up-and-coming rock bands in the place where the Beatles became known. And all those things can be done, and you can have a great listening tour of England. But um, I would say that uh, one of the cities that I found most intriguing to just listen in was Venice in Italy because you've got all those canals, and people float down the canals. So if you stand on a bridge, you hear weird, lovely, inchoate, oddball conversation by tourists from all over the world as they're passing under these bridges. And then everybody in Venice has a songbird, and they all keep their windows open, so you hear songbirds from all these apartments. And then you hear the wind coming down the canals, and then you hear Italian workers singing fragments of, you know, bel canto opera, or arguing with each other, which is the same thing. <laughs> and it's just a spectacle. And then, of course, there are all the churches that ring their chimes and bells, and then there are, you know, weird street theatrics and thousands of pigeons taking off and landing all at once. And, you know, you're just standing in a spot and hearing all of this simultaneously, and it's rather magnificent. So Venice is, of course, a noteworthy place for architectural sightseeing, but it turns out it's a really cool place to wander around blindfolded if you wanted to do that. But you could just buy my book. And How many languages do I know? Uh, I, it could be argued I don't know any. Um, you know, I, I speak Finnish passably, but not fluently. It was the language of my father and grandmother, not my mother's language. So, you know, I can get in trouble with Finnish, and I can make taxi drivers laugh. I mean, it, you know, um, I read French, and I can read some Spanish, but, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not, I'm not a talker in any other language. What kind of things is your guide dog trained to do? Uh, my guide dog is trained to watch out for cars, trucks, skateboards, uh, you know, all kinds of moving traffic, bicycles, stops at the curb, won't go into traffic until both of us are satisfied that it's safe. Uh, she's also trained to stop at the tops of stairs, the bottoms of stairs, avoid low overhangs. Uh, she can find the next street, the next door, the next uh, possible opening. She can take evasive maneuvers when working through uh, detours, obstacles, construction sites, things like that. She's also trained to uh, do what she's doing now, which is lie quietly in a public space and ignore all of you, which she doesn't really want to do, <laughs> but she can do it. Um, she's trained to be that way, uh, focused on airplanes, public transportation of any kind, any kind of public space. Guide dogs are allowed by law to go anywhere the public goes, um, but of course the trade-off is they have to be really good, and she's really good. There are a dozen dog guide training schools in the United States. Uh, they are on both coasts and some in the Midwest. My favorite three, the ones I you know, sort of universally recommend to people, are the Seeing Eye in Morristown, New Jersey, Guide Dogs for the Blind in San Rafael, California, and Guiding Eyes for the Blind in Yorktown Heights, New York, from which I have received my three guide dogs. I think those three programs put the most money and research into breeding their dogs. Pay up those fines or we put the Denver boot on your car. <laughs>